a tiny double strand of DNA. Not but what would be two single codons had it been located on messenger RNA. I always tried to get students to move so that they could see that molecular biology was nothing like the textbook. It wasn't static. It wasn't round, red, and blue balls. Language fails in a lot of places to describe chemistry and biology. But when you're seeing it or you're thinking about how does a cell know to communicate this, there's no language inside the cell. The great helicase roaring across the nuclear plane. There's only movement and charge and energy in the cell. To explore complex systems like the human body and complex diseases like cancer, we need to use many different methods of understanding. Dr. Jill Barganetti and her students at Hunter College have been using the creative and physical experience of dance to help feel and know how the body's chemical and biological processes work and what happens when, as in the case of cancer, they break down. Researching cancer presents a particular challenge. Our understanding of exactly what cancer is has changed over time, and it is clear now that a single cure for cancer is not a realistic goal. Different types of cancer are going to require different types of tactics. In this video, we will discuss what cancer is and how it can be investigated at many different scales, from molecules to tissues to people to populations. Let's start with the basics. What is cancer? Cancer is not a single disease. There are many different forms of cancers, even in a particular cancer of a body part. So there are organ-specific cancers, but even those organ-specific cancers are all very different cancers based on the genetics of the cancer. If you think about how a cancer arises, it starts off with your normal cell that then becomes increasingly more abnormal. I would say all cancers are cellular in origin, so we can say that as a definition of cancer. They come from a cell replicating out of control. Certainly our understanding of cancer has become more molecular, biology-oriented. It's clear now that cancers can share things across different organ systems. So breast cancer can be very, very similar to ovarian cancer based on the genetics. So I think that our genetic understanding has moved cancer understanding along. If you read the history of medicine, the paradigm for understanding things has changed or not changed over centuries. And cancer means a tumor that has the ability to invade and metastasize. So invade means push the boundary, typically of a basement membrane, of the organ or tissue in which the cancer is arising, and then metastasize means spread and form distant colonies that are autonomous and growing on their own. So when people talk about a cure for cancer, it's like saying a cure for infectious disease. I don't believe we're ever going to find a single silver bullet that's going to cure all cancer. Cancer research requires different types of experimental work from molecular assays at the lab bench to clinical trials. At any scale, cancer researchers need to think about how to properly design their experiments, and they often work with model organisms. Dr. Barganetti investigates molecular pathways that are involved in the development of cancers. So there are two basic pathways that we study in the lab. They concern two particular molecules or proteins, P53 and MDM2, and both are made from genes. The experiments that we do in this lab are biochemical and molecular biology based. We use a number of different model systems. So we use cell culture where we are able to genetically engineer human cancer cells to get rid of the proteins in question. When we put those cells into animal models, we can see that those cells that once were metastatic are no longer metastatic, that they change their aggressive qualities, so it helps us to then figure out what are the pathways that are pushing those aggressive qualities. We also use patient-derived cancers and put those into animal models to try to figure out ways to better detect the cancer cells based on our targeted therapies. Lastly, we use a microscopic worm model and try chemotherapeutics in the microscopic worm model. All three of our models are looking at 
dysfunctional P53 regulations. So they all have that in common. We try to utilize similar drug approaches in all three. So that means that we are treating the mice, we are treating the tissue culture, and we are treating the worms all with the same chemotherapeutic drugs at similar concentrations and dosages and looking to see how they affect those downstream pathways that we're interested in. Even though these experiments take place using different models, they can complement each other. The questions that can be asked really depend on the system that you're using. When we are working in a cell culture environment or when we are looking at cells, the cells can be manipulated easily. We can manipulate their genome. We can manipulate what do we want to do inside the cells, express genes and proteins and modify things. So we can do a lot of studies that tells us about the regulation of, let's say, a particular pathway that is relevant on disease or the modification of the protein. However, when we're looking at individuals, we can measure things, but we cannot really manipulate anything. So we use these two different systems to actually confirm information and to guide us. Cell culture experiments are usually carried out on individual cells that are growing not in the form of a tumor. We try to imitate the best possible that environment by growing cells in culture, but the conditions will be very different. However, the molecular mechanisms underlying these processes should be very similar. At the lab bench, scientists work with cells in petri dishes and with model organisms like mice and microscopic worms. But how do we get from that to figuring out what is happening in a human body? The answer is translational research. Initially, we thought that we would be at the bench and we would be able to translate bench findings into patients. And that was what the old definition of translational was, that you're doing some science, you're doing it in a mouse, you find an interesting gene, you develop antibodies against that, and now you put those into patients. That is an example of very direct translational research by the old version of it. Now translational has come to mean almost anything that also involves human tissues, because we're doing so much, we're learning from our patients now directly, and we use that to actually go the other way, to inform. We say bedside back to bench. And some people go bedside to bench and back, or bench to bedside and back. So I define translation as anything that involves human populations, human genomes, and human tissues. Anything where there is direct clinical relevance, I think of as translational. Training in clinical investigation is not typically part of medical school, or hasn't been, though I think many schools are now including it in their curriculum. So historically, there's basic science, which is really understanding how the world works, which frankly is immensely fun and very cool. And then there's clinical care, which is taking care of patients, which is also very interesting, very important, and I don't think anybody who does it ever goes home at the end of the day and wonders why they went to work that day. But the bridge between the two, how to bring basic science into the clinic, is called translational science. And that's what I do, and that's what our training program trains people to do. So typically in one's PhD, if one does a PhD, one learns basic science. And in medical school, you learn clinical care. You learn how to take care of people. You learn how to operate on people. You learn what to do in an emergency room. All of that's wonderful and important. But to combine the two, this sort of new discipline of translational science has developed. So how are experimental approaches different when you are working with humans or human population data? Clinical investigation is like any other experiment. And one of the things that I think is most important is to understand that the rigor that you would bring to any basic science experiment absolutely has to be brought to clinical investigation because at the end you need an answer you can believe. And the only way you can give an answer that you can believe is by bringing as much rigor to the process as possible. Population studies are studies that involve individuals. Therefore, it's quite important to consider that we cannot have any names or we cannot have any private information. It is important for the students to understand that clinical samples are quite precious because individuals have donated their time and their actual sample to participate in a study. So I stress to almost no end uh, the importance of being extremely careful with this material, but also how important it is that we actually have access to some samples that came from a person that has a particular disease and they're willing to give us some of that sample for us to understand what's happening.
But at the end of the day, it is still an experiment. So therefore, it needs controls. A control is a group of individuals who don't receive the treatment or they receive what's called a placebo. A placebo is a blank treatment. It could be sugar water, it could be salt water, but it's something that you think is going to be inactive. And with human beings, placebos are particularly important because a lot of how people respond to things has to do with what's in their head. And there's what's called the placebo effect. So one of the really key parts of most clinical trials is that people are what's called blinded. It means we don't know who's getting the intervention and who's not. But not only do the participants have to be blinded, but the investigators do as well. So it's best to get the most, the clearest, most correct, truest result. So I think if I had to give you a single takeaway, the most important thing that we teach our clinical scholars is the same dictum of first do no harm applies to clinical investigation because it's human beings. When you sit with a research participant, you wear two hats. You wear the physician hat and you wear the scientist hat. And the physician hat always has to come first. And the day it doesn't is the day you need to leave, in my view. The topic cancer biology is enormous, encompassing multiple scales and fields of scientific inquiry. But ultimately, we are trying to figure out a problem that so many of us face, personally or through people we know. It is a topic that unites us. The polymerase wants to help. In our performance at the end of the semester, the performance is their final exam, and they've all written a paper about a cancer gene, and then they choreograph a piece for it. And they use choreo poem in their pieces, and they use contact improvisation in their pieces. And in addition to them doing their pieces, I also perform one piece, which is a choreo poem piece, which has to do with how cancer unites the human family. And one of the things that I'm trying to teach them is that these genes are in common between all of us. There is no discrimination between the races for people getting cancer. All races get cancer, all people get cancer, and those genes are in common.